Hey everybody, Dave here. Today we're going to be looking at the flow control group of actions in Power Automate Desktop. Let's take a look at the comment action and I'll just type here is some info for future developers. And then I'm going to copy that a few times. On this last one, I'm just going to put a few extra letters to show that that's the fifth line and I'm going to click save. So this is a good way to just give other developers information about the code that they're going to see here because a lot of times uh, Power Automate desktop flows aren't the most readable thing ever. But I wanted to point out that if you add anything on the fifth line or further, you aren't going to be able to see it right here. So make sure you don't put important information there. <laughs> the other thing I want to point out is one useful way to use comments is to use them for to do items. So here is something I need to do. And then I'll, I'll go ahead and put it like over on a subflow. Call this something else I need to do. And then I'll search for the word to do. And that'll bring up all of the places in my flow where to do is found. And that's just a quick way to sort of mark off specific things that you need to do and where you need to do them. And as you come across those and, and fix them, you, know, you can double click on it and bring you right to the place. You can delete that. And then when you do the search again next time, it won't show the other to do item. Now you've just got what's remaining. So that's one way that I commonly use comments. Let's look at the wait action. I'm going to drag that over here. There's only one input. It's just duration. And it's asking for the number of seconds. So you'll always want to pay attention to anything like that to find out whether it wants you to input milliseconds or seconds. In this case, it's seconds. So I'm going to put in three. And so that would mean it will wait for three seconds once it hits that action before it does anything else. So let's grab another one. And here I'm just going to put zero for a second. We're going to put a breakpoint. What I want it to do is wait for three seconds and then break here. So I'm going to hit run and you'll see it wait for one, two, three, and then it should go to the next action. Now that's a static wait. So in advance, you know, I need to wait for three seconds or I need to wait for 20 seconds or something like that. I wouldn't always advise doing that. Be careful and be very sparing, very rarely use these kinds of arbitrary waits. Try to find some other way to watch for a process to open or a process to close or a window to show up or an element to appear, something like that. That's far better than using these kinds of weights, but sometimes it's necessary. So in addition to doing a static weight, you can determine it dynamically by using some whatever logic you want to. So you can use something like set variable in the variables group like this, and we will call this wait time for our variable. And here we'll just put three seconds and then we can go into the wait three seconds and we'll change this to use the variable wait time, save, and let's hit run. And this is going to do the exact same thing as before. It's going to wait for three seconds on this action. But the difference here is that now we can manipulate that wait time as needed. So if we just determine some kind of logic that we want to change the wait time during the running of the session, then we, we can do that. Why would you want to use this kind of wait time that's not hard coded, that's uh, you know not a static kind of wait, purely based upon your scenario? I don't think that there's any real benefit to doing this unless you think that you are going to change the wait time throughout the session, or if you know that you want to use this wait multiple times at different places throughout the automation, and you know that this is kind of like how you want to throttle it or make it run slower or faster. You can come in, change the value in one place, and now all of the places will basically update at the same time. So that's one reason you might want to use a variable based weight instead of a static weight. One thing you should be aware of with weights is that fractions of a second may or may not work and you should test it. So let's say we wait for one second here and then we wait for 0.1 second. This one should go a lot faster than this one, right? So I'm going to paste this. We're just going to break point and you'll watch how long it waits on one second. And then it went really fast over the second. So it appears to work from here. I have also tested this from the console and it appears to work there as well. But something that I've read is that it may not work when you run unattended for some reason. And it's possible that that bug has been fixed. Maybe that bug never really existed in the past, but it's something to be aware of because this input does specifically say uh, an amount of seconds. And even though it does allow you to put in a decimal, it's possible it might not work. So that's something you should test before you fully rely on it for production use.
Let's take a look at the region and end region actions. So I've dragged over region onto the canvas and it asked me to give it a name. So I'm going to give it a name like get random number and I'm going to save it. And let's say that I have some extra logic involved with getting a random number. So let's say I generate a random number here. And then for some reason I am throwing some variability into it. I don't, I don't know. We're just pretending here. Let's say we increase it by three and then we decrease it by two. Okay. This is a terrible algorithm. Okay. I recognize that, but let's say that we, for whatever reason, want these three actions to actually run to generate our, our random number. Uh, we get a random number, then we add three to it, and then we subtract two from it. As you start to increase in complexity in your logic, it can be a lot harder to identify which actions go with what other actions. So let's go grab like set variable and drag that on here. And in this case, I'm just going to go copy and just duplicate this a bunch. Okay. So now that we've got enough to, to actually scroll through, it gets to be a little bit hard to identify that the, this increase variable and increase variable. Oh, I meant to put decrease variable here. Let's put decrease variable to delete that. Okay. So it gets a little bit hard to identify that these actions don't have to do with anything down here. And so to make that more easy to read, you can drag these into a region like this. This doesn't really change any functionality. Uh, you can't right click and do run from here. So something to be aware of, but then you can collapse it. And now it's kind of like encapsulated. You can ignore what's inside that while you're reading or, you know, glancing over your flow. Now let's say that you are trying to get various actions into here. I wanted to point out that, yeah, you can select actions and drag them in, but you may actually find it to be a little more performant, easier to do to actually drag the end region down to pull some actions in. And then you can do the same thing for the top part here for region. You can drag it down like this to exclude actions or drag it up to pull them back in like that. So I just wanted to point out that that's something that you can do. I didn't notice you could do that for a little while. Sometimes I find that I'll accidentally lose this end region. I'll accidentally delete it or, or move it somewhere. So let's say that it goes away for some reason. You're going to see something like this. And all you need to do is go back over here and grab end region, drag it on here, drop it somewhere on here, and then you can kind of move it to where it needs to be. And that's pretty much fixed the issue. As far as I know, there's no functionality difference between having actions outside of a region and having actions inside of a region, except like I said, when you right click, you can't do run from here where, when they're inside of this region, which actually might be something that you want to be the case. Let's look at run subflow and exit subflow. To start off with, let's create a subflow that we can work with. I'm going to call this new subflow reset app state. In reset app state, we're going to just put a comment and we're just going to say that some logic is happening here. So to do implement reset app state logic to close and reopen the app. Okay. And then let's go to the main flow. We'll do run subflow, choose reset app state. We'll come back to this input as expression and make fun of it in just a second. I'm going to click save and then let's go grab wait. I'm going to drag it here and then we'll put a three second wait. And then in reset app state, we'll go ahead and put a three second wait down here too. And so I'm going to run this and you'll see it's going to run the subflow. So it's doing the reset of the app state and then go back up to the main flow, do its waiting three seconds and then end. That's how to call a subflow. But I guess Microsoft decided we needed the ability to dynamically pass in the uh, name of the subflow we want to call. So let's create another subflow real quick. We'll just call it this subflow underscore one. So I guess what you could do is you can open this up. We can change input as expression to true. And now it wipes this out and we can put in a value. We can just type reset app state like this, or we can call subflow underscore one and we can type it by name. You could also though input a variable. So you would do set variable. You could, however you want to assign those specific text values into the variable and then use the variable right here. So, you know, like, um, subflow name 
like this or something. And then it would, it would call whatever subflow you, you want to. I can't think of a reason why this is useful. I certainly I think there's some edge cases where I could imagine this, but it does not seem like this is what Microsoft should be focusing on. How in the world this got implemented before a bunch of the other things that are needed? I have no idea. So we're just going to stop making fun of it and we're just going to turn this off and we're going to pretend like that doesn't exist. Okay. That would make me happier to print this, pretend this doesn't exist and instead pretend like dark mode was implemented. Okay. As if those are two equivalent like levels of difficulty. <clears throat> Run subflow, reset app state, and I'm going to save this. We're actually going to delete subflow one because we don't need that. Now for exit subflow, we already have our subflow. We already know that we can run like this. It'll go into the subflow. It'll wait a few seconds and then it'll go back up. But let's say that um, maybe where this wait three seconds, we want to not reset the app all the time. Like some, we want to actually give it a chance to check and see if the application's already open and already ready for us. So let's put some logic above this that will check for that. We're just pretending again. And if the app is in the state we want it to be in, then we don't worry about going down here to this wait three seconds. We just immediately go back up because we're good to go. So let me put a, a comment here. We're going to put to do implement check for if app is already in a good state. And then let's get a set variable. And for now, let's just hard code that. So like app in good state. We'll put that to true. And then we need an if statement. If app is in good state, if that is equal to true, then we want to just go back up. We don't need to keep going on this logic. We'll do exit subflow right here. So it's kind of like a return statement. If you have ever made functions and you do an early return statement, that's what this is. And now if I run this again, let's actually make this go slower though. So we can see it happen a little bit easier. I'm going to set this to 500 milliseconds run delay and we'll see it go in. And what I want you to watch for is it's not going to do a wait three second here. So it goes in, it finds that it's true, it exits the subflow, and now we're doing our wait three seconds up here on the top, but we didn't do it inside of the subflow. So this is just one example of how you might implement exit subflow and how you call you know, a subflow. It seems fairly simple, but I wanted you to see like a standard way to use those two things together. And I would say go wild with creating subflows. See if you like having more subflows or fewer subflows. See if you prefer to have your subflow end you know, at the end of the entire uh, subflow, or if you like to do early returns, I think you'll see why it can be good and bad to do something like this. The more complex your logic is, the harder it can be to identify at what points could it jump back up? At what points could it end? That kind of thing. So you should just practice a good bit until you start finding a way to make it readable for you and for other developers. Let's look at the get last error action. We have two things to configure store into, which means what variable we want to store the last error message. And then we have clear error so we can turn that on or off. So if an error occurred and we retrieve it into here, then it will get cleared. So it, it will not be, you know, retrieved again. So let's do this both ways. I'm going to uncheck this. So it's turned off. Clear errors turned off, hit save, and then let's duplicate this. In the second action, I'm going to open this up and turn on clear error and save. And then let's, let's basically cause an error. And the way that I like to do it most often is to go get a file action called read text from file. I just put in something nonsensical like does not exist.txt and that doesn't exist in that folder. And I don't change anything else here, but in on error, we want to change all errors where it says throw error right now. We want to change that to continue flow run and specifically do go to next action. Let's click save. And what that results in is when we run this, it's going to have an error, but we won't even be able to tell because it's just going to continue and move forward. But because we're immediately going to check the success of it, 
that's okay that we did that. All right, so what we're going to do is put breakpoints on both of these. I'm going to step. We're going to step. And this basically has an error. It should not still be going, though. I need to step again, don't I? Okay. So that had an error, but you, as you can see, there's nothing to, to, that tells us that we had any kind of error. Instead, we're using get last error to identify whether or not something did occur. So I'm going to step. And this grabbed our last error. It says... Uh, file this path not found and then so this is actually kind of weird it says get last error stored into last error and clear error value but we didn't check the box to clear the error so I think this is just wrong so let's just see if it is or not when I step again we should see that last error still gets populated yeah so let's let's test that again I'm going to copy and I want wait here at the end. I don't need to wait for any. We'll do like three seconds. And a break point. So for our three get last error, this one you can see it's turned off. That's interesting that it says that it's it says clear the error. This one, it is turned on, so it is going to clear the error. And then this one, I think we can just turn it off because it's not going to matter. What I want to see is that this one does retrieve an error, but because it doesn't clear it, this one retrieves the error. It does clear it, and then this one tries to retrieve an error, it will not receive anything. So we could actually change our outputs to last error one, last error two, and last error three. And in that case, I can just take all these off and we can just run them to the end because we have different outputs. So last error one got an output. And then the second one got the same error as an output, but because the second one's configured to clear the error, then when the third one tried to retrieve the error, it got nothing. It says no error. So that's actually important to note. Uh, whenever you check to see whether or not this is populated, it's not as simple as going, is this empty? Because this, this error is some kind of object. I don't know if it's a custom object or what. But it is some kind of object. So when we check it, let's use an if statement. First, we'll we'll do last error one. And let's actually look inside this. Last error one. Yeah, if you expand it, you can actually see all the stuff that's going on with that object. And I think when I've done this before. I think what I found that worked well enough was to check the message, like last error dot message. So let's try that. Delete this first part and we'll go with last error one dot message. If that is empty, mm, do we want if it's empty or do we want if it is not empty? Here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to take this off. We're going to use a set variable after each one of these. Last error one is empty. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Is empty. We can just set this. Last error one. It's hard. <laughs> It's like going off the screen uh, here. Last, oh, I can just search for it. Last error one and then dot message dot is empty. So I can go last error one dot message dot is empty. And I'm going to store that directly into a variable that I can read. I'm gonna paste that and we're going to change this one to last error two. And paste it one more time for last error three. And now I should be able to run this from the beginning. Okay, so this first one, when we retrieve the error, we got something. So is it empty? No, it's not. It's false. Second one, because we haven't cleared the error yet, because this one uh, doesn't clear the error. The second one retrieved the same error. So is it empty? No, it's not. It's false. 
And then the last one, we were trying to retrieve it because the second time that we retrieved the error, we cleared it. Then the third time we retrieved the error, uh, it got no error. And so we checked to see is last error three dot message dot is empty. Is that empty? True. So we got true here. So now we could use like an if statement to check those like any of them. I'll pick just one of them though. It's so like last error one is empty. If that's equal to actually what we want to do, if it's equal to false, then you could do something like, you know, like a message box or something. Display custom form, custom form to designer. Toss text on here. We'll throw the um, last error dot message in here. And actually, is this going to let me, you know, is this going to give me buttons? I don't know if this will give me buttons. Let's see. Okay, so now we run it. Okay. It just, I'll, yeah, that looks terrible, but still, I, I've got the X right here. So here is the error message that occurred. So uh, this is really just some silly different examples that I'm showing you of how to use this, but hopefully this shows the functionality of last error. The fact that you can clear it if you choose to in this input right here. And um, basically if, if an error occurs, even if you use exception handling to sort of bypass it, like this, that still is an error that occurred and Power Automate Desktop still holds on to it until you go use get last error and clear it. Okay, so you could still retrieve it later on. You could probably even do some other stuff and then check for the error later. It just all depends on the logic that you need. So hopefully this section will help you to understand how I'm using get last error in other sections of this video because I may not explain it as thoroughly there. Let's look at the stop flow action. I'm going to drag this on here and it says inflow successfully. What I should do is just put something else on here that shows that nothing is running after it. So I'm going to drag wait on here. We're going to put 120 seconds. So if it doesn't wait for 120 seconds, <laughs> we know that it worked. So I'm going to run this and you'll see that it'll end immediately. And it just appears as though it ended because we set to successfully. Let me go ahead and change that to with error message and we'll say, oops, some something went wrong save and then let's run it again now it's going to stop the flow and this time it's actually going to throw an error for us this is the kind of thing that will go in the logs and whatever else so i mean you might want to actually log your message but i'm talking about in the power automate desktop the power automate logs what i want to show you though is that you can stop the flow for whatever reason at any point in the flow it could even be in a subflow so let's create a new subflow called close down and let's say that I move this over, drop it in here, and then we'll put wait 20, 120 seconds still there. Uh, let's, let's actually change this to something just in case I mess up. Let's change this to like 10 seconds. <laughs> and then I am going to call the subflow. We'll do run subflow, close down. Okay, so what it should do is immediately go to close down and then it should stop the flow with an error. Okay, so you see it stopped immediately. Same thing if I change it back over to successfully. It's going to do the same thing where it stops immediately except without an error this time, and it's not going to wait those 10 seconds. So you can kind of see the possibilities here. Now you imagine what if you put it inside of an if statement or uh, whatever. You could start to get it to the point where it's hard to even find where the stop flow is. So I might would recommend being careful, uh, just like with this exit subflow, where you use this because it can get hard to track down issues and i would say there's no wrong way to do this but when you come up with where you should use the stop flow try to just make it consistent with what other developers on your team will do so if you all have a close down or tear down or whatever type of subflow then and you use stop flow inside of that no problem but you don't want to have all of you doing different things if your standard is to have this on the main flow, then be sure by all means to keep it that way.
I guess the last thing I'll show you is just like, we'll toss in an if statement and we'll call this like, if last error is empty, then we will stop the flow successfully. And then else, let's stop the flow with an error message, failed uh, reason. And then we'll just put like last error. Okay. And then we'll go grab, I'm going to do get last error and we'll store it into here. We can actually clear the error. And then one more thing I need to do is just force an error to occur. So let's go do read text from file. C colon backslash test does not exist dot txt. And that should throw an error. But what we want to do is change this. So on all errors, continue flow run, go to next action. So what I'm doing is basically saying, uh, I'm going to force an error here, but hopefully that error will still be tracked by Power Automate and we can store that into last error. And then when we go to stop, we'll determine whether or not something actually uh, occurred and we can stop successfully or stop with a failure based upon that scenario. So let's see how it works. All right, so it should fail. It gets the last error. And because last error is not empty, it then went on the else path because this turned out to be false. So it went on the else path, it did stop flow, it said failed. And the reason was uh, file C test does not exist dot txt not found. And so that way I can go troubleshoot things and figure out what's going on. So this is just a small, like very simple example, I think, of how you can kind of split it up and do stop flow based upon your scenario. You should definitely cater this to what you need. Don't assume to do it exactly like I've done. It m probably doesn't even make sense for this stuff to be on the same subflow as this stuff over here. So, you know, maybe this should actually be up here on the main uh, subflow and then we run it like this. And I just wanted to point out, it doesn't matter whether or not it's in a different place because all the variables and stuff are global in Power Automate Desktop, which is unfortunate, but, you know, it works we can basically copy those actions, put them in a different place, and this still works just like before. So here's just a hopefully a simple example that will get you started if you haven't used the stop flow action before. Let's look at the go to and label actions. First thing we're going to do is look at an example where you simply need to skip some steps based upon some conditions. So the scenario I'm going to make up here is that we have different account types that we're processing, residential and commercial. And for commercial, we have extra steps that we don't do for residential accounts. So what I'm going to do is create two labels on here for points where we're going to jump to. So let's say we have commercial specific processing steps. And then we have another label where this will be all accounts processing steps. Okay. So if you're a commercial account, then we do a few steps and then whether you're res residential or commercial, we're going to do some more steps. So first let's set up a couple of set variables at the top account type, and we'll put residential in here. I'm going to copy that. And in here we'll put commercial. And I'm just going to, I think we will disable this one and then we need an if statement to check what kind of account type this is so account type i need percent symbols around that account type equals residential let's see if the account type is yeah if it's commercial then we will go to here so let's go find our go to Put that on here and we'll choose our label, commercial, specific processing steps. And then otherwise, if our account type is not commercial, then we'll put another go to in the else place and we'll go to all accounts processing steps. So what we've effectively done is we'll, uh, you know, enable and disable these as needed to test commercial versus residential. So if it's commercial, then we will jump to here and process. 
if it is residential, then we will jump to here and process. So just to give ourselves a few extra steps to see, let's go with like um, commercial blah blah and copy that set variable. We'll call this all accounts blah blah. Okay, so we will. I'm going to run this, and what you'll see is since I have commercial set to enabled, it's going to set account type to a commercial. It should go into here. It should go to this label and then do all of the steps below. Let's hit run. Okay, so it went to here, it jumped to here, and then it went all the way down. Now let's go up and let's change this to enabled, disable this one. So now our account type is going to be residential. So this time what we'll see is it's going to go into the else part and it should jump past all of this down to here. So it should skip the steps right there. Okay, so it skipped the steps. This is an example of something you can do. I think that this is this kind of logic, this go to and label type of logic is something that was, you know, just baked into Visual Basic. And I'm not a huge fan of it, but I understand that it can give us some extra functionality. So, you know, it's here, so I'm going to use it. Uh, but I would recommend using this sparingly. Another way that you can use this is to do loops. So let me delete this stuff. I'm not saying that you should use this, but you technically can. So let's put a label up here and we'll, we'll call this loop again. And this time, instead of the go to statement being above the label, it's going to be below the label. We'll choose loop again. And here, if I did this, okay, this is an infinite loop. It's just going to constantly go to label, go to label, go to label forever. So what we would want is some kind of exit uh, strategy, some way to get out of this. One way we can do that is with stop flow. So I could do like, um, I could do a counter. Let's do that actually. So what we could do is uh, if some counter that I haven't created yet is greater than five, then we want to stop flow. I haven't created the counter yet, so let's do that. Let's set variable at the top. We'll set counter equal to zero. And then each time that we loop, we will increase the variable right here. We'll increase counter by one. So set counter to zero and then label doesn't do anything right here initially. Increase the counter to by one. And then if the counter is greater than five, then we'll stop the flow. If not, then we will go to loop again. So I'm just going to run this and you'll see it go through this logic a few times until eventually the counter will be greater than five. So once it reaches six, it will go into this and it will hit stop flow. And uh, now it will do it. And now it stops the flow. So you can use go to statements to go to labels based upon whatever you need to. Okay. There's, there's no limits as far as doing it within a specific subflow or on the main flow. But I will point out that even if you had a subflow that had a label on it, like this, test, and then I go back up to the main and I try to change this go to, there is no test label because you can't traverse subflows. You can't go from one subflow to another. You can't go to another desktop flow, which that would be crazy. Um, so I, while go to statements are like, mm, they can be a little rough because it can make things hard to read. Microsoft did make a, dis a good decision to not allow us to jump to another subflow. That would be so mind-blowingly confusing. If you find yourself needing to do a go-to statement to go to a label on a totally different subflow, you probably just need to reorganize your code in some way, kind of rethink things through. And I would say the best way to accomplish that is to first take all of your go-to and labels out. Just remove them completely and make your code work without it first. And then when you finally get to the point where you're like, I could really benefit from a go-to and label right now, then implement it. But don't make it foundational from the start because you may not need it at all. Let's look at on block error. Let's just go ahead and call this try to read file. We're going to come back into this and configure it because it can be a little bit complicated, but I'm going to walk you through every single piece of this and talk about each piece at least a little bit. 
So I'm going to hit save. So the idea of on block error is the same thing as what you get for exception handling inside of a single action. So let me show you exception handling inside of one action. Uh, in case you didn't see this in other sections of the video, I like to reproduce this with files. So let's do read text from file. In this case, I'm actually going to use a variable though. We're going to call it file path and we're going to come back into that in just a second. Let me go create a variable set variable. We'll name this file path inside that. We're going to put C colon backslash test backslash does not exist dot txt because it does not exist save. And then I'm going to use that variable throughout this. So read text from file. Uh, if I were to run this, it's going to set file path to a path that is pointing to a file that doesn't exist. And then read from read text from file is going to throw an error like you'd expect. But if I open this up, I can change the on error setting, go into here to go over to continue flow run exception handling mode has a few different options. Go to next action, repeat action and go to label. I'm going to leave it like this for go to next action. So I'm going to save and then show you that now it's going to run past this action. It is going to fail, but we can't really tell that. And you can see this little shield symbol indicating that there's some kind of exception handling set on this thing. And so it's passing it up. Now at this point I could check for last error and then I could handle that if needed. So that setting that I just changed to make it be able to kind of like handle it and continue on that exception handling, the same kind of thing can be done for multiple actions in a row, because right now what this is doing is it's only handling it for a single action. Well, let's say I had another thing that I was doing with files. Now this may not make a whole lot of sense, but I'm going to basically show you two actions in a row dealing with the same file that where, where like either of them could throw an exception. I'm going to say that we're going to wait for the file fail with timeout error and we'll put a duration of one second so that it happens quickly and save. I'm going to go back into reads from text file and take this exception handling off. So it's going to throw an error. So now we have two actions in a row that deal with interacting with the file. Both of these could throw an exception. It could be uh, issues with connecting to a shared drive. It could be that the file actually doesn't exist. It could be a number of reasons, but there are actually situations where this first one waiting for the file will work, but then reading the text from the file for some reason doesn't work. And I think, you know, 99% of the time that's not going to happen, but it's possible. That's the kind of scenario we're talking about here. So yeah, I could put exception handling in each of these separately, and that may not be a bad decision. That might be the right play, but I'm just showing you another way that you can handle it. Let's say that you kind of just want these things to try. So go wait for the file and then try to read the te text from the file. You don't know which one of them might fail. And if either of them have an issue, you want them both to retry again. So we can take these and drag them into the on block error. This is very similar to doing like a region. And while it's inside of here, it's now that exception handling that's configured inside of on block error is what's going to take over for these. Now I could still configure exception handling directly inside of these, but I'm going to show you that in this case, I would prefer not to. So both of these will throw an exception. If I run this right now, this is going to throw an exception. The on block error is also not configured to catch or deal with any exceptions. It's going to let it bubble up. So I'm going to run this. This is going to throw an exception. And then if I disabled this and I ran it again, this one will also throw an exception. Okay. So they both throw exceptions. Let me enable this again. What I want to do is go into on block error and there's a number of ways to handle this. I'm going to show you a I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'd call it simple, but the, the way that makes most sense to me, uh, but let me talk about each of these kind of, um, settings and different options that you have. The first one is it says new rule. And honestly, I don't know why it's called rules. Uh, rules to me sound like conditions, but this is basically saying actions, new actions that you want to perform in the case that the on block error is triggered, meaning any error happens in any of these actions that are inside of the on block error. If that happens, then it's going to do whatever rules you've put in place. So the first rule I'm going to put in place is set variable. I'm going to call this on block error counter. And then I'm just going to add one to it. 
Okay, I'll show you in a little bit why I am doing this, but we're going to keep track of how many times does this on block error happen. And then I'm going to do another new rule. We're going to do a subflow. We actually need to save this, go out and create a subflow real quick. So let's say reset app state. I'm not going to do anything inside of this, but let's just do like a set variable that doesn't do anything. But we'll pretend like in here it does some steps to reset the app state. So inside of on block error, we added the variable that's just going to get incremented so we know how many times this has happened. The other new rule will be run subflow. I'm going to choose reset app state right here. And now whenever on block error gets triggered, it's going to do two things. It's going to run the subflow and it's going to increment this counter. I want to go ahead and show you what that would look like. This actually will run by itself. We will increment the variable. We actually, um, I might set it up here. So let's do set variable, put the name of the variable. We will initialize it to zero. And that might be the only counter that I'm worried about having. Yeah. So I'm going to run this. And what you should see is the on block error counter gets incremented to one and it runs this. You, you saw it ran the subflow because I configured it to do that. On block error count is set to one. Now, it doesn't make a lot of sense in this case because I haven't finished configuring on block error, but I just wanted to show you that these rules that you set up, anytime on block error is triggered, it's going to do those things. I'm going to change from throw error to continue flow run, and now we get another drop down we can choose, exception handling mode. In this case, we get five different options. Three of them are the same for when you are dealing with an individual action. So go to next action, which would just go to the next action. A repeat action, which would do the action again, and then go to label, which will go to a label that you've predefined. The two new ones that we get are go to beginning of block, which you can assume is, you know, the beginning of the block. And then the other one is go to end of the block. So let's say we have an error on the first action. We might want to just jump to the end and continue on. That one makes perfect sense to me. Let me just show you that one first. I'm going to click save. And remember that this is not going to throw an error exactly. I'm going to run this. However, there is still going to be an error and this subflow is still going to get triggered and our counter still gets incremented because those rules will happen every time, but we don't end with an error because our chosen sort of way to handle that, the way to handle that exception is to go to the end of the block. Now, along the way here, just keep in mind, why would you do one or the other? It's totally dependent on what you need. This is one of those things in, in programming, whether it's low code or, or, High code, not low code, whatever. It's just something you're going to have to get used to and decide for yourself what you need in any given circumstance. Now, a lot of these situations, you're just going to, it's going to be obvious because your organization or your development team handles things a certain way. You have a certain precedent for how to handle these kind of scenarios. So more than likely over time, you'll just know what to do. But in this case, I couldn't tell you what the best way is to handle it. It kind of depends on what's the likelihood that retrying is going to help. If there's a chance it can re that retrying helps, then you should. So let's pretend like retrying this might actually help. So let's configure that. Right now we have no retrying going on. We do have like some kind of handling of the exception occurring, but we don't retry. So let's change exception handling mode to do go to beginning of block. And then we're not going to change anything else inside of here. I'm going to click save. I'm going to show you that what I've essentially just created is an infinite loop. So I'm going to run this. We are keeping track of the count, but we're not doing anything with that count. And that's sort of the problem. So this is just going to run. And theoretically, this would go infinitely. And the on block error count will just keep incrementing. We'll keep running reset app state forever. Now, this is something that you're this this next part. I'm, I'm choosing like how I would implement it. It's doesn't have to be done this way. And I really just thought of it off the top of my head based upon other stuff I've done in the past. So is it the best? I don't know. Let's stop this. And I'm going to go above these actions and I'm going to implement a check on the counter. So let's go to the conditionals group, drag an if statement over here. And what we want to look at is the on block error counter. Is that greater than, let's say three. Okay. That should theoretically make it try three or four times. I don't know. Math is hard. So if it is greater than three, if the counter is greater than three, which in this case we got to nine, so we would have stopped a long time ago, 
I could do something like over here in the flow control, I could do uh, run a subflow, I could do stop flow, I could do exit subflow. Uh, really, it just depends. Well, actually, exit subflow wouldn't work here because we're on the main flow. But I think what we're going to do is a go to statement. So let's do a label do close down procedures right here, and then we'll do a go to like that. Uh, and then let's put something before it, like a comment here that says something like, do this step only on success. Uh, variable. Do this only on success. So what I'm trying to say is that this set variable is something we, like I've described it a couple times, it's something we should only do in the, in the situation of a success. So if we come across this where we go on block error counter is too many times, well, we're going to jump past that logic and go down to here and then finish up. Let's grab a wait action. Just put three seconds. I'm going to put a, a break point anyways. And now let's see what it does. We should see it not loop in infinitely. And once the on block error counter reaches four, then it should go to close down procedures. And so it should bypass this set variable. I actually just tossed a breakpoint on it to make sure it would have stopped there. So it's going to bypass this. And now we're at the wait because it didn't run over this stage at all. Is this the best way to organize it? Again, maybe not. Maybe some of these things should be in subflows. Like <laughs> I'm not trying to say that this is the best way to do it, but this is a way that you can interact with these actions. I think that this makes sense, even if it's not super readable, this is a, a fair way to attempt the, to do exception handling over multiple actions together. So it doesn't matter which of these fail, it'll go back up and try them again and also avoid an infinite loop. Now, let me open up the on block error again, and let's look inside of exception handling mode. We haven't done go to label. So, um, let's go ahead and do that. Now, if I choose this, as far as, unless I'm overlooking something, I don't think there's any like retry capability built into this. So you can't tell it like, oh, do this a certain number of times. You have to build that logic in yourself with this kind of like, you know, counting and whatever it actually, no, I take that back. It does let you increment the counter, but it doesn't have anything that lets you check the, res the, uh, the condition of that counter and then, uh, cancel. Now, I suppose now that I think about it, you could... You could use this reset, this uh, run subflow. You could use that to check the results of the counter and it could do whatever it needed to. So I, that'd be something to think about. Okay, but for now, I'm going to change this and do go to label. And the label we're going to choose is do close down procedures. And I'm going to click save. And what we've done now is um, I think that this is not going to be necessary anymore. So I'm going to delete that. Okay. So now we're not retrying multiple times. This is just going to try one time. If it fails, it will increment this counter once it will run the subflow one time. And then instead of going to the end of the block, it's going to jump all the way down to this label instead. So it goes in here, it's going to fail, jump all the way down down to the label and you can see that it didn't run this set variable because it had a breakpoint here so it would have stopped there. Let's look inside of on block error again. Exception handling mode uh, and then we also have go to next action and repeat action. I have stared at this for a little bit of time and I can't imagine a scenario where you want to do this I think but I guess in this specific case it's 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 not a good design but it's okay so what this is saying is if this fails then it will go and try this if this fails then it will go to the end basically because there's no actions after it so let's just see how that looks my assumption is it will run wait for file that will fail but it will still go to read text from file it okay now that's interesting it actually ran reset app state twice and incremented the block error twice. That does make sense because each of these 
had separate errors. Okay, I was going to say that seemed pointless, but that's actually kind of cool. Um, I, I think that there aren't going to be that many scenarios where in an on block error that you'll want to choose go to next action, but you know, it's possible. Now, what, the one that really doesn't make sense to me, and I, I say that and watch it make sense immediately, but is repeat action. So I'm going to run this. It fails. And then it fails. And then it fails. So I, I feel like the only way that this isn't an infinite loop all the time is if you use the subflow capability in the on block error that in the subflow it, it it would have to like stop the flow i i can't imagine any other way that this works and and like maybe that's what the expectation is that your subflow would handle actually running stop flow if needed um so my thought though is that for the most part you're not going to want to use go to next action or repeat action uh, what makes most sense to me is these last three and really I think I like the last two go to the beginning of the block if you have some capability to a, if you want to be able to retry and you're going to build in avoiding an infinite loop and then go to end of block if you want to just move on from the block immediately if it didn't work out uh, go to label seems like it, it could basically replace go to end of block but you would want to think through that and what kind of logic you're skipping and stuff like that. But it, you know, it could make sense as well. The last thing we haven't gone over is capture unexpected logic errors. I don't know anything more about this than what it says right here that it. So if you divide by zero or you do an out of bounds, you know, array kind of thing, then it will capture them. I'm unsure why you wouldn't want to capture them all the time, but maybe their thought is, that shouldn't be possible. And it, it, essentially, that's design errors. That's all I can think. I, that must be what they're what they're saying. I, I'm not sure what to say about this. I think I would just leave it turned on, and then, you know, suffer the results of having made a bad decision later. So that was the flow control group of actions in Power Automate Desktop. And once again, I have said a lot of words, and I don't know where it came from. <laughs> so I hope this helped you. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.